Hey guys, Uncommon Ramen here again. Uh, today with another episode of Gaming on the Go. Uh, we are going to be taking a look at a game called Roll Through the Ages, The Bronze Age. Um, this is going to be the biggest box um, out of all of the games that I'll be featuring on this series. Um, so you can imagine this isn't that big. That means everything else is going to be smaller. Roll Through the Ages Bronze Age is just one of many of the Roll Through the Ages titles. Um, this is, I believe, the first one. Um, it is also part of Griffin Games' bookshelf collection and uh, is, all, is accompanied by uh, Force Sale, High Society, Gem Dealer, and Money. Uh, and is the only one that didn't get a travel edition like the like the previous four, um, for obvious reasons, which we'll see inside the box. Um, and is also created by Matt Leacock, the person who brought us Pandemic, as well as the Forbidden Island and Forbidden Desert games. Um, it is a game that can be played with one to four players, so let's take a look inside the box. Uh -huh. One of the things that I really enjoyed about this, and, and what is actually probably the biggest reason why it could not be made in a um, travel version, I suppose, is that every bit of the components here are made of wood. So these are the pegs that uh, keep track of your resources. Um, as with any game that has a pad of paper involved, I always laminate the number of sheets. Uh, equal to the number of uh, maximum allowable players. So, that way I don't run through the uh, pad of paper that's in here. Um, just a smart idea. You can use wet erase, dry erase, your choice. Uh, but it just uh, it gives the game a little bit more of a longevity. Not that like it's a small pad of paper at all. It's actually probably one of the biggest pads of paper that I've had for a game um, ever, now that I think about it, but, you know, it's just for posterity, I guess. Also, we have ourselves a little rules insert. The rules for this game are actually fairly simple, so you can see that this is more of a brochure than it is an insert, and in fact, the other end of the brochure, the back end, is just a, uh, crib sheet with a, uh, well, that's what it is, just a crib sheet. And then you have your inside pages that have um, basic rundown of what, what you can do. And then we get to the player boards. And like I said, everything in this game is made of wood. So the game boards are no exception to this, as you can tell. Pull these suckers out. There are four of them, obviously, for the maximum allowable players. And then last but not least, we have our dice, which are also, obviously, wood. You can see right there, you can hear, it's clearly wood, um, with a bunch of different facings on them. Um, so this is the contents of the game. Um, there was a point in time where this game was actually really difficult to find. Um, it had only been printed once and was out of print. Um, recently it got a second printing and now you can, it's relatively easy to find this. I think you can find it on Amazon. I know you can find it on um, eBay for relatively cheap. And I'm pretty sure you can even find it on the geek market on boardgamegeek.com as well. Um, for I think 20 bucks. I think I paid 24 for this. Uh, there was a point in time when it was in the first printing where uh, I think the lowest you could find this for was uh, 45 maybe $50. So, uh, and I'm sure uh, trying to find the first printing of this game is still going to be relatively expensive um, just simply because it's not in print anymore. So, quickly going to run down here. Each of the pegs actually represents uh, a color of one of the resources available to you. So therefore you're just going to put the pegs in the starting position on all of these resources except for food which uh, starts with this cutout circle here at, at three. And that represents uh, 
actually the number of starting cities you will have as well, um, which is indicated right here at the top of the card with the circled in uh, cities. <coughs> as you play through the game, you're obviously going to be able to uh, purchase more cities as well as developments and monuments. And you'll also need to keep track of disasters, um, which are listed right here. Um, and it's just based on the number of skulls that you roll, as well as if you do not have enough food to feed your cities. Uh, it is one food per city. So if you have four cities and only three food, then you, you have one city that goes through a famine. Um, these are just the dice facings explained. So obviously the three little wispies here, which I guess are wheat, um, are three food. So you just adjust your pegboard up by three food. And then any of the pots that you'll see, so there's one right here um, that indicates uh, one good, but you'll also see right here, and you can see it right here on the list here, this side counts as two goods, but also counts as your first step into uh, a possible disaster. And then we have the three workers, um, and these three workers can be split to do any of the projects that you would like them to do, which include building cities and building monuments. And then of course you have your three worker, or two workers or two food choice right here, um, just to allow you to choose whether you want to go with uh, building more cities or, sorry, cities or monuments, or um, adding more food uh, just in case. And then last but not least, you have your money, um, seven coins. So rolling this one time will give you seven coins, which also help you to develop. Um, when you're developing, you need to have the cost of 10 either in coins or in goods or a mixture of the two. So if you have seven coins and three goods, then you do have 10. <clears throat> Keep in mind, however, that there is no way to keep track of coins, so if you do not spend your coins, you simply just lose them. So if I roll a seven coins and I just don't have what it takes to purchase any of these developments or the developments that are left for me to purchase are too expensive, then I will simply lose the uh, coin altogether. I wanted to explain the goods really quick because in the rule book it kind of confused me and I don't know if this confused everybody or if it was just me that it confused. But when you are adding goods, you are going to add the goods from the bottommost peg and then to head on up. And what that means is let's say you have three goods that you rolled. So you're actually going to move your peg of wood over one, then you're going to move your peg of stone over one, and then you're going to move your peg of clay over one. Um, and then let's say this is what your board looks looks like and then uh, next turn you roll four goods well in that case you're gonna move your peg of wood over one more your peg of stone over one more your peg of clay over one more and then you're gonna move your peg of tapestries over uh, one um, you will never get to the spearheads unless you can make a total of five or more goods during your turn and even if you do make more than five goods unless you make ten goods you're not gonna move the, pe uh, the spearhead peg more than one time um, this is an interesting uh, system because what it what you can see here is that the spearheads are actually worth the most amount of uh, uh, I guess gold if you will when it comes to making your um, developments but you also have to keep in mind that at the end of your turn any unspent goods uh, will be brought down to a total of six so if I have three wood and six stone and nine clay and four and tapestries then it looks like I'm gonna have to move this peg down to this area this peg I just simply lose and then this peg I also just simply lose which now brings me down to five total goods so it is encouraged that you spend your goods and in fact if you don't you lose them so stockpiling is not really an option in this game um, that is how the goods work as far as the accumulation of goods. Uh, the more you get on the die, the more likely you are to get to a spearhead. Otherwise, you're just going to be continuously building up your wood and your stone um, without actually getting to the point of accumulating a spearhead. But also at the same point in time, the spearhead 
at its lowest is worth five, which means that unless you spend a lot of goods, you're likely to lose that uh, value. Um, take a look at these. The um, developments that are available to you in on this sheet are basically just little permanent boosts that will allow you to either uh, re-roll die or it'll take effects that are over here in the uh, disaster section and completely nullify them. So for instance, uh, if you have medicine and your opponent rolls pestilence, uh, you no longer have to worry about the uh, pestilence happening to you. So. Uh, that's actually a good point that I, I almost forgot here. The disasters, for the most part, affect you, except pestilence. Um, so if you were to roll um, two skulls and you rolled a drought, then um, the minus two points would be affecting you. However, if you were to roll three skulls and roll a pestilence, the pestilence does not affect you. It actually only affects your opponents, unless you are playing a one-player game, in which case it will affect you. Um... There are uh, other things for rolling 4 and then 5 plus, um, but the only way you're going to roll 4 or 5 plus is if you um, build more cities. So every time you build a new city, you're going to receive a new die, which means that at the beginning of the game, you have a default of 3 dice, but as you build the cities, you're, you're going to start to get more dice to roll. Um, with the caveat being that uh, if you don't, if you build the city, you have more mouths to feed, and if you don't feed them, then you're going to lose points uh, for every city you don't feed. Furthermore, there are these monuments that you can build, and this is where the workers come in uh, as well as uh, building your uh, cities. They will also be able to build uh, monuments. And each of the monuments will have a number in a square box and then a number just sitting by the side. The number in the square box is the number of points the, pers the first person to build the monument will get. So if you are the first person to build this pyramid, you will get 12 points. Then subsequently, subsequently every other person who builds that pyramid or completes it will only get 6 points. So it, it is kind of a, a big deal to build the... Uh, monuments here that if you're building them to build them first um each of the boxes here that gets marked off basically by disasters um is going to count as points against you at the end of the uh game and essentially you don't want them to happen that's why we do the developments here to try and avoid any of these types of things um if you look here uh religion says that you don't have to worry about revolts anymore and then up here medicine says that you don't have to worry about pestilence anymore irrigation says that you don't have to worry about droughts anymore so you have ways to proactively um uh i guess protect yourself from skulls, which then means that the skulls are no longer really scary and they're actually worth two goods, which makes them kind of a lucrative thing. Earlier, I did mention that the workers can be split amongst building cities and building monuments. So if you have three of them, you could you could potentially say, I'm going to put two here in the city and then I'm going to start building this uh, monument. And all you would do is just fill in the boxes for the amount of workers that you have. And that goes for any amount that you have. So if you have six workers, then you can split, you know, three and three, five and one, four and two. It's, it's your choice. Um, so you roll um, the dice and collect the goods. Uh, you're going to feed your cities, uh, build the cities and monuments, uh, buy developments, and then discard excess goods. So that's basically it. Once you have uh, built all of the monuments available to you, or you have uh, researched your fifth development in here, the game ends. Uh, you're going to put a star at the top of your uh, sheet if you are the first player, and everybody that... Uh, is after the first player will get to take uh, one more turn, assuming that the uh, first player was the one to end the game, um, or until everyone gets up to the star player, essentially. And then you're going to score basically points uh, on your developments, which are the uh, points right here. 
which you'll add up and put right here. Uh, monuments, again, you'll just add up the points and put it in this box. Uh, any bonuses, uh, which you'll find uh, right here and right here. Um, then you'll come up with your subtotal and then you'll subtract any of your disasters right here. And then that'll come to your total and the person with the highest total is the winner of the game. And that is Roll Through the Ages. It's nothing like uh, any of Matt Leacock's um, cooperative games, but it is still an incredibly genius idea. And the uh, resource system itself is probably one of the coolest uh, resource systems that I've seen in, in quite some time. And this is actually an older game. Um, and as you can see, this is a really small box. Like, it's not that big by comparison to uh, some of your normal game boxes like Puerto Rico or uh, Castles of Burgundy. So it can still get put inside your carry-on luggage or your check bag or even your backpack for that matter, um, which makes it really appealing. Um, every bit of the, co the components here, like I said earlier, are made of wood, which means they're very high quality. Um, you know, they don't feel like they're going to fall apart, tear, or anything like that. They give you a giant pad of paper that, uh, you know, for, for keeping track of your points. So, I mean, you're not going to run out anytime soon, but if you're like me, you know, it's nice to have the uh, longevity of having it just laminated. Plus, I, I like the idea of being able to put the dry erase or the wet erase here and just erasing it off and using it again. Um, they are double-sided as well, and so this is this is how thick it is, but it's really twice thick because it has two sides, so you can use both sides, which is also something that you don't see a lot of uh, companies doing that when, when they do the um, pad and paper. So, um, it's just something that I think uh, if you're bored and you're in a hotel room, out on a job, and... Um, you just want to kill some time, this game w is actually really good at doing that. And it's actually a fair amount of challenging <laughs> as well. Um, and, and when you're playing uh, single player, you're, you're just looking at trying to beat your last score, which can be extremely challenging, especially if you uh, fall into the category of AP players, analysis paralysis. So... Definitely go check it out. It's much more available now than it was um, a couple years back uh, because it was only in its single printing. Um, but it's definitely worth it. it it's very travel worthy. Um, and it is an incredibly fun game. So that is Roll Through the Ages, The Bronze Age uh, by Matt Leacock, um, uh, distributed by Griffin Games. Um, check it out. Uh, if you like the video, go ahead and like and subscribe. Um, I will be back with more content. Um, yeah. Peace.